Hello, and welcome to Idea to IPO. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KL Gates LLP, which is a fully integrated, full service global law firm on five different continents with nearly 2,000 attorneys and approximately 50 offices. We've got a fantastic panel for you today. We've got Anna Fokina, who is investment director at DCVC Bio. We've got Ephraim Lindenbaum, who is the managing director at Advanced Ventures, and Claire Pribula, who is a managing director at the Yield Lab Asia Pacific. Today, we'll be talking about the latest investment and innovation in ag tech. Before we get started, I'm going to share with you a little bit of background about how today's conversation will go. We will have a panel discussion for about an hour. Uh, at that point, we will move into an audience Q&A uh, discussion. So if you've got questions, fantastic. Please submit them via the Q&A function. I'm not going to be monitoring the chat. If you want to chat amongst yourselves in the room, feel free to do so. I'm handling all the other tech in the background, and so I get task saturation. Additionally, uh, it, we, we ask that you fill out the audience poll because we'd love to know who is live and with us today. And if you're not live and with us today, but watching this on an asynchronous basis, we're glad to have you here with us too. So with that in mind, we're going to get started. I will ask Anna first to tell you a little bit about herself, about her fund and the vertical that she invests in. Anna? Hi, everybody. This is Anna Fakina. Um, I'm at DCDC Bio. So uh, I've been at the fund since inception, which was in 2018. So we're turning about five years old this year. Um, and we are a life science focused fund. So we invest in therapeutics and human health and also agriculture and industrials. Um, primarily early stage seed and series A. Uh, we tend to be a lead investor, um, co-lead as well, sometime join the rounds. Uh, but we really try to take a larger ownership in companies and help founders to get through the journey. And we allocate substantial capital for full-on investments as well. I've been in venture for six years overall. Uh, prior to DCDC Bio, was at Monsanto Growth Ventures. Um, MBA and finance background. In terms of the verticals, um, we don't specialize within the fund. So it's anything within life sciences, um, therapeutics, agriculture, industrials. Uh, on Arctic side, we tend to be very opportunistic. So we look into robotics, we look into um, crop editing, crop health. Um, so really depends on a particular company, and I'm happy to dive in deeper into that later on. Fantastic. We're delighted to have you here, Anna. Claire, would you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your fund? And I also want to make sure that everyone knows you get the gold star for staying up the latest to attend. Well, well thank you. I see, though, that there's somebody from Thailand that's that's joined, so I'm not the only night owl. Somebody, an insomniac from uh, Thailand is on. Um, I'm Claire Pergula. I'm the managing director of the Lab Asia Pacific Fund. We're part of a, we call federation of funds. I don't know that that's really a venture capital term, but we we started with uh, the Lab and uh, first ag tech fund early stage ever in 2015, set up another fund after that, and then Europe and then Latin America and Asia Pacific is the youngest fund. Uh, we're focused on all of agriculture, so crop science, precision ag, animal health, sustainability, traceability, food ingredients. Um, and we have across all of our funds, uh, 80 companies that we've invested in so far um, have had uh, multiple exits. And I'm very happy to be here with you here today. Wonderful. We're delighted to have you here as well. And NF, the returning, uh, I guess, champion, maybe at least of the day. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jason. Appreciate it. Great to be on a panel with uh, with such great colleagues here. So, Frank Lindenbaum, Managing Director of Advanced Ventures. We're a technology, health, and wellness VC here in Silicon Valley. We've been broadly investing across the ag and food sector since 1999. We're one of the oldest ag tech funds out there. We've been investing in ag since it wasn't cool. Uh, you know, we we invest across the broad spectrum of agriculture and food science as well. We've invested in, uh, you know, areas that touch the genetic side all the way out to the supply chain. Typically today, we like to invest in ancillary technology amongst the ag sector, uh, you know, molecular diagnostics for high-speed food testing, uh, you know, food traceability, 
uh, you know, elements that are involved in, in health and safety. Today, we're very excited about tapping into some of the ESG and the climate side of the ag tech sector with investments in Jewel Case, which is a mobile power solution powering this next generation of farm machinery uh, with battery technology, clean, green, but more importantly, uh, new farm technology requires much more specific technology than the old school generators. So we're very broad in the category. We do a lot in the food space as well. We typically are early stage investors in the, in, in the space and we'll invest through the lifespan of the company. Well, fantastic. Delighted to have you back on the panel. Good to see you again. Uh, and let me just share with you who's in the room. So I'm going to allow the audience maybe another 20 seconds to fill out the poll, and then uh, I'm going to share it. All right. That was the fastest 20 seconds anyone's ever seen. Uh, so we've got about a quarter of the audience in from the San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, with about a third from the rest of the United States. Uh, and then a smattering from the rest of North America, a few folks from South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, not forgetting Australia. Welcome. Uh, additionally, if you're watching us on a time-shifted basis, since this is recorded, uh, thank you for joining. And then as kind of it's typical, we've got about 40% of the room are first-time entrepreneurs, about 15% are serial entrepreneurs. We've got a few people who are in an early stage company, some at the growth stage, and then a, a, a few investors and a few in government. So welcome. We're glad that you're here. Let's let's kick off by first just talking a little bit about um, the venture capital market in general. There have been a lot of activity, a lot of volatility since you know the pandemic started, and then uh, you know as we've sort of moved through time. It'd be great maybe to just sort of recap what's going on a little more broadly from 2022 into Q1, and then even more specifically in ag tech. Do we have a, a taker on that or should I share with the, okay, go ahead, Claire. Uh, well, from, from what we've seen, you know, venture capital across the, you know, industries is, is about half of where it was. Um, we have somebody in our team that's done a little bit of pulling together some data, um, but early stage, Seed, seed stage is starting to tick up a bit. Um, and ag tech funds are still mostly focused on series B and later. Um, our fund is early stage seed and series A. And, and in, in Asia Pacific, we're seeing the valuation starting to creep uh, back up again um, in, that, in that segment. Um, I think that there's going to be maybe some booing going on with a, a potential unicorn that's happening with e-fishery in Indonesia that will lift all the boats up in the water. Um, just as a retrospect on last quarter there, um, in the ag tech, this is globally, there were more than a billion, um, a, a billion in contraction in capital uh, for Q4, from Q4 of 2022. So it's a big drop. Uh, first quarter um, being below 2 billion in total ag tech funding. Um, quarter over quarter, venture capital dollars invested across all industries increased by 1%. So that made ag techs drop and funding more pronounced than across all the sectors. Um, but despite the reduction in investment dollars, the number of deals, the number of deals continue to grow. So that's what we're seeing. And then we're seeing increases in, in biological crop protection sector. Um, uh, supply chain was probably the biggest drop. Um, uh, and the average tech investment uh, shrunk uh, to 6.6. .6. This, this is out of crunch base, this data. Uh, down from 13 million, in, um, 13 million in Q4 2022. So um, the smaller round size trend has been consistent for the last year for ag tech startups. And so that's my my little short snort on that. No, thank thank you for doing the legwork and pulling pulling uh, pulling numbers. Uh, we appreciate it. I, interested in in f and anna's experience as well i mean is that you know the sort of broader mm -hmm. data and market trends matching what you're seeing in the market especially with respect to the u.s market yeah i mean i think overall um we feel a slowdown in activity um i, I think people becoming more cautious uh by people i mean investors uh there is a lot more demand on traction on uh, progress, um, the milestones between rounds uh, becoming more important, you know, 
people, investors paying a lot more attention to that. Um, we also focus on earlier stages, uh, so seed and series A primarily. Um, I haven't seen a drastic change in valuation uh, for uh, seed and series A. Um, I, I think generally uh, the feedback that I'm getting is a lot of the later stage uh, companies are getting hammered a lot more because a lot of those fundraisings happen during the peak of the market. And of course, it's harder to maintain that valuation. So companies start to take down rounds or they try to extend the runway any way possible by asking their investors to extend the runway bridges. Um, and uh, I think people don't want to raise in this environment as much as possible, just because they're hoping that uh, the environment is going to get better. Um, and we see that across both biotech and ag tech. Um, we still see uh, new companies, but it, it does feel, I don't have specific numbers, but it does feel that um, uh, the inflow has been reduced, um, in, in my opinion. F, if, if you have anything to say on the... Yeah, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I mean, I, I, you know, I agree with both both my colleagues here. I mean, I think the market is is had a bit of a flight to quality. I mean, we saw some pretty outrageous valuations. Most of that tended to be on the the software and tech side. I think ag tech as a whole has been a little more steady, broadly speaking. Uh, you know, we did see a very large downtick in the food tech space during the. the <laughs> the pandemic, uh, predominantly around the supply chain disruptions and the entire shifting uh, store resets, et cetera, really affected the food aspect of that. Whereas the supply chain in ag tech was really jammed up. There was a lot of money that went into that thereafter, but there's a ripple effect, right? So when the food space, you know, both brand, food tech, et cetera, started the falter in the 2020-21 says that ended up impacting ag tech, you know, 18 months later, as SKUs weren't getting reset, you weren't seeing as, as many new products come in there. As always, I think ag tech as a whole follows a much different trajectory than traditional technology investment. You know, the exits tend to be a much longer cycle. We tend to see a much slower adoption curve, uh, you know, especially on biologics or some other you know, deeper, uh, you know, ag related technologies, you know, some of the lighter weight drone robotic, et cetera, tend to have faster acceptance. But typically, we see a three to five year cycle for market penetration within the category. In our particular case, we did spend some time in the broader cannabis space as a sort of quicker adoption curve to ag tech that was very helpful for some of our ag tech companies that were able to gain quick traction in a, you know, in a market that was allowing for less price sensitivity. And as they've now transitioned to traditional ag tech, I think we've seen a really nice lift there. But I think there's, you know, in our particular case, we tend to invest in, you know, what, what I would broadly call the ancillary size. So, you know, as I was talking about diagnostics, food testing, food safety, uh, you know, elements like that are, you know, really, uh, you know, very strong as we tend to see it. And for the most part, I think, you know, ag tech valuations have maybe softened, but but much, much less so than, than we've seen in the software space. So, you know, I think the funds are also fairly well capitalized. There's a tremendous amount of capital on the side. Oops. That was a mic drop. There was just a tremendous amount of capital there on the side. Uh, on the sidelines, <laughs> just, I said. Just like, we're waiting for, yeah, what, what's yeah. going to happen with it? I just we, uh, chime in while he's, well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, that's right. Thank it. Please. It is 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 getting unfrozen. You know the the fact that there were you know uh, there weren't the kind of rounds, large rounds in the first quarter of this year. As well, actually, there were none. <laughs> there were hundred that were one hundred fifty million um, sort of uh, rounds. There were none of those in in the first quarter. It's not a bad thing. Startups are you know are now having to focus more on on capital efficiency, like Anna had said, and and you know doing more with less is likely going to be a theme for this year. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if if in our region, and maybe this will be felt other places, but definitely in, in Asia Pacific, if e-fishery, you know, um, it does turn into a unicorn, with which looks like what's happening, this is going to, I think, be a bellwether moment to get things moving again. Mm. 
Um, and but there's there's there is also growing evidence that unlike a lot of I don't know you know Anna you probably work with um, and and um, uh, F probably work with uh, startups like I do and they're always debating on whether or not to have strategics involved early at two you have them too early in the round they get all you know Jason all nervous about that and 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 we're finding that's really more of a uh, growing evidence that that's a good strategy, a good strategy to have um, is to get some of the strategics involved early, whether that's a, you know, with with some sort of a, um, a trial or whatever, to, it helps in kind of putting them on a trajectory towards towards a, an exit. Anyway, that's uh, just a couple of things. Yeah, I yeah, I, I agree before. with that. I think one thing that I want to add is um, it, it's almost like you interview for a new job in a market where there are very few jobs available or in a market where it's really easy to get a job, right? And right now we're in a market that's, it's really hard to get it. And raising rounds, you have to be a lot more prepared. And I, I think we have a lot of entrepreneurs uh, on this panel. Um, I, I just recommend be super sharp and be prepared to pitch. There's no you know second chance. Your first chance has to do the job. Um, it takes longer to pull the rounds together. So finding a lead is very difficult. But even now, when you have a lead, it's not automatic that you get the round syndicated, which was not the case a couple of years ago, right? Like once you have a lead, it was like this. Now you still have to do the work. You still have to have the conversations. Everybody has to be on top of the details of data in the data room. Uh, so you just have to be on top of the process. And, you know, take it as, you know, a very important process, not something that just, you know, I'm going to go there and money will magically appear in my bank account. Yeah, and, and I, if we, we were picking up and running off of the thread where you had sort of left off, which was that uh, there was kind of more dry powder than maybe there has almost ever been right and it's sitting on the sidelines and what you know what's it going to take to maybe unlock some of that. And or what is locking some of that up, including high interest rates or, uh, you know, the banking crisis that we just got through? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, let, let's not, you know, underestimate, you know, SVB's collapse to the broader venture market. I mean, that sent, uh, you know, a shake through the broader space. Uh, you know, a lot of time has been spent over the last, you know, six, eight weeks now inside funds, diversifying. A lot of time was spent with portfolio companies. You know, that really was arguably, I think, probably one of the darkest moments just from a, from a, you know, challenge standpoint since maybe the 2008 collapse, only from the standpoint that, you know, very few of us have had to, you know, relate to, you know, all of their accounts being frozen and the inability to, to make payroll, the inability to continue operations. You know, uh, you know, many, many executives that, that we have dealt with, uh, you know, really, you know, put some serious gray hair out there. So let's not under, underestimate that. I mean, I think, you know, as it applies to ag tech, you know, a lot of things have shifted here. We've got a number of issues at, at hand. Uh, you know, let's not underestimate the Ukraine crisis on, you know, the global economy. But as it applies to ag tech, you know, Ukraine was a, an agriculture powerhouse in Europe. It supplied a significant amount a product to the whole world, uh, you know, that went all the way from, you know, as simple as grain, all the way into materials and metals and, 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 you know, into the, the entire sort of, uh, you know, broader inputs food chain. So that, that's had a very large impact. You know, these storms on the West coast, uh, you know, have had an impact already here. We're going to see more of that. Uh, you know, I think that there is a, a huge looming cloud that the snow melt here in California is going to reflood the Tulare Lake bed. That is the you know fruit basket, veggie basket of the entire country. That's gonna that's gonna really blow a lot of doors out. Uh, you know, and on top of that, you know, it's magnifying some of the big issues. So I think you know when we look at ag tech, we really look at some epic pain points that are out there. You know, the labor shortage it continues to get worse and worse. You know, when we look at you know automation machinery, there's a lot of pressure out there, whether it's fuel prices whether it is, you know, uh, emissions issues and state issues, whether it's generators being outlawed, whether it's, you know, various high technology now being trying to be integrated, if you will, with old school technology and power systems or lack thereof communication. So, 
you know, I think we see a lot of that, you know, supply chain still is pretty rickety. You know, the ag supply chain, especially when we when you move into finished goods, tended to have this massive broker network that was run out of people's pickup trucks with cell phones. And, you know, a lot of that, you know, got very, very challenged during COVID. So there's still a lot to be had in terms of transportation, supply chain, technology. I think the issue around getting new tech in, getting new, uh, you know, sort of breakthrough tech into the, you know, into the traditional ag space is always been difficult. It's more difficult now. You know, as we like to say, agriculture, at least in the United States, is predominantly a finance business. It's a, it's a whole lot more finance than it is farming, right? You know, most uh, family farms, the average of which is a six to eight million dollar enterprise, operates on a tremendous amount of debt. The fact that the debt markets, you know, we've seen interest rates go up as quickly and as rapidly as we have massively affects the family farm and even industrial farm market. I mean, if you think about it, when you, you know, go to your average, you know, 100 to 500 acre farm in the Midwest of the United States, all of that farm machinery is being financed. All of the inputs are being financed. All of the seed is being financed. All of that is operating on an incredibly thin margin. You know, the typical margin in farms is four to ten percent. You tack on another three to four points plus plus in interest expense, you've just effectively cut the potential EBITDA of that farm by 50 percent. So the broader ag space here in the United States is feeling 50 percent poorer when they start the process, meaning that they're spending more on their hardware, they're spending more on their inputs, and that you know, and they're not necessarily getting that output side. We are seeing it with inflation, but the entire supply chain on the back side has got inflation issues. So you know, they're not seeing the lift associated with their cost increase on the back side. You know, and 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 the consumer just couldn't manage to 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 stomach that. If you think about it, you know, we aren't seeing two x the cost for corn or for wheat and, and the market couldn't sustain it. So a lot of that is being absorbed on the farm level, which is then reducing you know, new spending on new tech, reducing spending or taking risk. You know, it's really a, 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 you know, a bunker mentality right now in that space. So, I mean, th th that obviously, you know, those are quite a number of challenges that you've just articulated and identified. What, what are, Anna and, and Claire, what, what opportunities are you seeing for startups and you know what what is sort of exciting what what are some exciting verticals within ag tech yeah uh, I, I can start here um okay. i the way as i said we think about it uh very opportunistically so for us we're looking for a larger market uh we're looking for a clear exit scenario um as you know agriculture is uh, generally a very unique space where exits are pretty tough. Um, and uh, there are certain themes that I think playing around that we're observing the human labor is definitely one of the biggest issues. And I think that's why you see a lot of automation, robotics on the field. We've invested in a number of uh, robotics, um, farming as a service companies. Uh, uh, but all of them are sort of focused on really helping farmers to re remove the volatility in human labor. Um, uh, the other areas that we like um, that might be a little bit further away from uh, the upstream farm and what we call more industrial, we look into material space and, you know, sweeteners and uh, a lot of these things. Um, and um, it really depends. I think not only you have to have a really good technology, you have to have a very clear product market fit. And I think that's where a lot of companies are struggling with. Uh, I see a lot of uh, companies coming from strong backgrounds, universities, and they have really interesting technology. But then when you get to the business side of things, uh, they struggle, right? And so combination of having um, the, the both is very important. And within ag, especially, you really have to understand the ops of farming. And um, there was a wave uh, of uh, companies started by younger people 
who either have families in farming or maybe even don't. And it's really hard, I think, for them to really understand the dynamics uh, of the space. And I mean, I remember <laughs> something stuck to me. Uh, one founder said, we actually made the interface of our software uh, really bad, like, you know, 80s looking because farmers are more um, convenient with that. It's easier for them to use that than something high end, right? And, and so a lot of details like that you have to think about, but you also really need to think about what problem you're solving for the farmer. Um, and that can be um, you, you know, like we don't really like um, investing in just diagnostics on the field. It has to be a close loop. Um, it's good to have data, but if it's not actionable, you know, farmers can either learn um, and then, you know, adapt the, the knowledge and not use the technology anymore. Or uh, generally, you know, they, they may know that may possess the knowledge they just really need action to be taken. Uh, so those are some of the uh, dynamics that we've been observing, but, um, you know, um, it, it is really, I think, specific to, it, it, is it a crop protection? Is it a food space? Is it robotics? Like, what are we really solving for? But again, market uh, size, clear product market fit, um, and uh, an exit scenario, is it primarily a m a right? Who is a potential buyer? Or is it a private equity? Then can you generate the cash flows? Isn't it an IPO? It's probably more a B2C type of product and more downstream. Yeah. And, and, and our, on our side, I mean, some of the things that we're excited about are platform technologies like Wataya Aqua, which is, um, we're just, we're the lead of this round and we've got just a little space open on it. Um, uh, but that's, full end to end across the value chain of, of uh, animal health in aqua. You know, it's the, the challenge is to be able to, to, to ensure that no matter where you're fish, there's hundreds of species, you know, most of us don't eat salmon every day that are across smallholder farmers as well as medium size that, that are riddled with inefficiencies. There hasn't been a lot of sophistication happening. There hasn't been new sensor technology in like 25 years. So so it's a space that we're really bullish on in aqua and ocean and, and being able to, um, with, with nutritional models that have been built out over you know, decades, uh, the co-founder is out of animal health uh, and he's, he's the head of animal health in the University of Gulf, um, has uh, automated this with algorithms and machine learning. So calculations can be done in, in you know, thousands and seconds incorporating all the different environmental constraints. So you're going all the way from the commodity to the to the feed companies, to the mills, and all the way down to the farmer and then back. So that you know a farmer can say, look, I'd love to feed my get my fish to their optimal feed conversion ratio as fast as possible. But you know, I've got a, a budget limitation. How can I back into the right kind of feed based on that? 60 70 to 80% of their costs are feed. And the rest of the time is spent keeping them alive. It's also sustainability to be able to, to ensure that they're not just dumping the water when it goes bad as, as opposed to just making sure that they don't overfeed the fish. Um, so there's an entire you know, value chain there. It's a fast growing protein and extremely important. And it's a platform that fills a gap that exists. We're bullish on that. That's you know, underwater and then terrestrial, there's um, you know, fossil, which is doing the same, but you know, in our climate that we're trying to figure out on a daily basis, having microclimate data uh, intersecting with satellites so that and built out by agronomists. So, it's, uh, you know, what Taya is doing it by fish, by species, by stage of growth, uh, Fossil is taking it from, you know, each, each crop. And in this way, doing prescriptive, predictive analytics to be able to make sure that they can reduce their fertigation costs, increase their yield, um, and reduce the use of water. So high impact. And then supply chain, we're bullish on with Demudo as a company we've invested in and we love what they're doing because what F was saying about, you know, the race to the bottom, especially around um, vegetables and, and, pro and, and produce, you know, it's a, it's a, a thinner and thinner margin business. Um, and if, and what they've added on to the full end and affordable supply chain for change, every constituent get something out of this as opposed to just one big retailer. Um, so, and they've added to it trade finance. So if you can now finance the trade 
these small medium uh, producers can 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 help them get their money quicker and remove some of the the burden and what we don't want is farmers that can't afford to grow what they did before turning all this great land into you know um uh when when uh um energy fields you know we need the food um and then the last one i'm throwing in there just because it's 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 pretty novel and unique and you know these are the ones that are hard to to get lots of venture capital around and animal health immunology. I mean, African swine fever is decimating this entire category of swine. Um, you know, we won't, you know, we're gonna lose our bacon. <laughs> um, the the um, African swine fever is a, is a, is a disease that's been around for a hundred years and it's been stable for 50. And this platform allows you to be able to, to uh, address African swine fever without having to kill a lot of piglets, which is what you normally have to do for an immunology solution. But these sorts are really special, you know, this is important. This is a, you know, it's off the coast of the US right now. It's a homeland security issue. It's all, it's even in Singapore. Who knew that there was a boar population in Singapore? It's in Malaysia. It's decimated China and Vietnam, the two largest pork producers. So it's something that has to be addressed. And what you'd want is some a sustainable solution to be able to do it. So these are some of the things that are top of mind. Sorry if that took too long. Uh, no, no, it was it was it was very helpful, very helpful, very concrete. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, going back to what my colleagues are saying, I mean, I think the you know good advice to entrepreneurs is is really as they think through their go to market strategy, how are they going to do business in the space. You know, it's a ground game, you know, for the most part in agriculture, you know, no pun intended in the U.S. especially, you know, the running joke is social media marketing in agriculture is, spent, you know, sponsoring pancake breakfasts at the local, you know, diner, right? So it's a very different model than, you know, traditional tech companies. And, you know, I think we've seen so much of the tech folks try and penetrate traditional ag and it's, you know, it's it's a schlag. I mean, the one thing I will say is, you know, your solution needs to, you know, move everybody's needle the minute they look at it. It has to save time. It has to save money. It has to be low cost. You know, farmers are very, very smart and they're very, very innovative. They brought us the wheel, right? So at the end of the day, you know, the better mousetrap story is not often what a farmer is going to really invest a lot of time in. You really have to, you know, it's not a nice to have, it's a must have. And in this case, it's a, you know, really a situation in this market where it is a, you know, if you don't have it, you will crash type scenario. And especially when we're seeing this impact from, you know, high interest rates in the farming, you know, weather conditions in the farming market, you know, it's really important to, to zero in on the mass pain points that are there, right? You know, fuel, very expensive for the farm. How do you address fuel, right? Lots of lots of free sunlight, but it's really hard to get that to power during the day. You know, there's a lot of, you know, input challenges, but there's a cost factor there. So I think you really have to, you know, dig into those areas and, and often find alternative markets. You know, there's big ag, which is industrial crops that are in the, you know, traded markets, but then there's also boutique crops, smaller ag, you know, certainly as Claire is talking about, you know, the broader protein space, both traditional and alt proteins. So there's a very broad, broad spectrum of what we think of as ag and food. So so I guess maybe just to zoom out for a second, I mean, it is now, if you know, if you were somebody who's contemplating being an entrepreneur and then starting an ag tech company, is now a good time to be doing that? Or is you know, given the conditions of the market, you know, it's now suboptimal. It, it, every we need all hands on deck. I mean, it's a the last trillion dollar industry to be transformed. There are no other industries left. <laughs> that have, I don't know why this one was the last one. Can't figure it out. But anyway, it is. And uh, there is so much inefficiencies and so much opportunity for innovators. Um, it's it's endless. Uh, you know. Uh, I, I I mentioned the, the category of aquaculture. You know, this is one that um, for some reason, I guess because you can't see what's under the water, it's a little harder. Um, but it's also, there's so many different species. It makes it difficult. Um, it, we need more attention there. We need more attention in water technology and, um, you know, things that are uh, 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 adaptive uh, uh, crops, 
that can be, you know, we can't grow what we in this region in Queensland and places like this, you just can't grow what you used to anymore. So you're looking for new kinds of crops, one that's out in San Francisco, Treviva, you guys probably know with the Pangamia tree, which is all over this region. And, and that's a winner because it doesn't require much water. It handles periodic flooding and things like that. We had an exit with one of our, our fun one and fun two with hovercress, which, uh, you know, another alternate crop. It's, a, it's actually a common weed, the pennycress reed, weed that has a little seed that expresses a high protein oil. It was a tremendous exit. <clears throat> and, you know, this provides great, not just for the, the farmer to off season make monetize, but who knew, you know, it would not only good for human protein, but uh, good for jet fuel. So the exit was, a, was you know, um, Bayer, Bungie, and Chevron. And so these are, these are things that are, you know, there's just so much opportunity and regenerative soil technology, I think Anna mentioned. I mean, there's just so many things that need to be done simultaneously if we're going to be able to make sure that, you know, we have enough food on this planet. It's not about having there's enough being grown. It's not getting to its final destination, a huge food waste issue. Um, you know, so if we can remove mycotoxins off of things as they start to move in the supply chain, that's, you know, half the battle. But there's, it, it is every aspect of the spectrum, there's opportunity. So yes, now is the time. Yeah, I mean, we love companies that are started and, and gain traction in down markets. I mean, you know, I think this is an opportunity to find and fix real problems, right? So for us, this is very meaningful in, in a very flush market. You know, a lot of you know lesser opportunities, you know, can 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 really survive. But you know, this is when great companies are built. You know, I remember the last you know sort of downturn in the 0810 cycle. You know, our crop of startups were fantastic. We had a ton of exits. You know, entrepreneurs that build companies in rough times, uh, you know, are usually successful in good times. I think in, you know, in the ag space right now, if you can get, you know, the market to buy your product and gain traction in a down market, you know, you're just going to explode in an up market. So I think we're really excited about that. Um, you know, and there's there's so many problems, to, to Claire's point, to, to Anna's point, that are out there. Uh, you know, food safety, real big issue right now. And it, and it just continues to get worse, especially with the weather. You know, we, we, we have a high speed test company that's low cost, high speed, costs less than a Petri dish and takes six hours. Right. That's something that, you know, farmers and the ag producers and the packers and the shippers, they can get their arms around something like that. It's the same or less cost and it's faster right okay that makes sense it's not going to cost you much it's not going to cost you hardly anything might even save money and you're going to be more efficient and make more money with it that that's a story that a farmer and a producer and a packer and a shipper can have a conversation around right now right to, to claire's point you know we have a company that uses ozone to sterilize and, and and kill both microtoxin and other forms of you know contaminants you know, that's great tech. It's it's green, it's clean, it's cheap, it's efficient. You know, that stuff wins the day in this market. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just add that um, it's probably a great time for natural selection in a way, right? Um, what you see in hyped up markets is influx of entrepreneurs and all kind of companies that maybe have an idea and they just want to try and they kind of come and go and die a, a lot. Um, if they don't die right away, they usually, you know, it takes time uh, because money is there and it's flowing everywhere. And so what you have to realize now is um, if you're really passionate about an idea, you should totally start it at any point, right? And you should just be more careful about uh, the fundraising and strategy. And, you know, again, as I said, you, you, if you're a great company, uh, investors will come and they will provide the funding. Um, the, the other side to it is not all companies are VC backable um, and you don't have to be a VC backable company, right? Like if you have a great idea and it's more of, cash generating and you don't have this hockey stick, but it's a great idea. You still can build it. You just don't have raise, uh, you don't have to raise money from VC investors. You can find alternative sources of capital, 
um, and and build a business that way. But um, I, I think this time just kind of removes um, a lot of noise, and um, we have stronger companies, and that's to the point of uh, Ephraim that uh, we love companies that. Uh, start and survive during this period because they're more real, they more, um, they have more traction, and uh, you know they just know how to get through tough times. Uh, Anna, you mentioned not all companies are sort of eligible to be VC backed. Would you, would you mind because I've seen a, even though I'm not monitoring the chat, I can't help but from time to time glance at it. There there's some chatter about sort of what what the model is um, and what is sort of VC backable. If you could share maybe generally. Sure, sure. So I think it's very important to understand that uh, VC is also a business, right? We're not a charity. We don't give money for free. Uh, we also have investors who invest in us and we have to report to them. And we have the fiduciary responsibility to maximize returns. So uh, a, a lot of our strategy is to find you have to understand, A, there is a timing. It's not forever. VCs usually have about 10-year horizon. So if you invest, you have about 10 years to return. And you really get worried, I think, after year six, if there is no exit. And year six, it may sound kind of far, but if you invest in seed round, uh, may not be that far. Right. Uh, the other is we have to maximize the return. So obviously, all of the things that I said that we thinking about is who are they acquire, what's the potential exit, how big is the market. Um, when you raise money from investors, from VCs, you have to understand how big their fund is and why is it important because that will determine how much money they can put in and how much they want to get back. Right. So if you are a later stage fund, you're probably going to be a bigger fund. So you you really try to get a higher exit, maybe lower X return, but money on money, you know, you have to generate attractive returns for um, your piece. Um, and so that's where the hockey stick comes in, right? You kind of invest early, the company, for example, builds out the technology, there's no traction, then boom, all of a sudden you get that high return in year, you know, six or in great markets, maybe even in two years sometimes, right? Um, but that's the profile that investors generally uh, are looking for within venture capital. If you think about private equity, it's going to be a very different profile. They're going to look for companies that have a lot of cash, generating cash flows. They're going to lever you up. And their whole model is how to properly make the financial engineering to make a return. So you VC is your partner. So you really need to understand um, how they make money, what's um, at stake for them. And, um, you, you know, it, it is a business. It's not, you know, a charity relationship. And sometimes VCs can be harsher because they see the path and you derailing from that and they can try to tell you that's the path to go. If you absolutely don't want to have that, don't take the money from VCs because, uh, I, I mean, I do hear a lot of that, like VCs are evil. They're not, they're just trying to do their business as well. So, uh, and, and I think if you as a founder understand that, um, that makes it a much easier relationship and, you know, experience overall. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just to follow on what, what Anna's saying, which is a great kind of, you know, top down on how we view things, you know, and I think I think she mentioned it earlier, you know, Claire alluded to it in a lot of her conversation, you know, is really how you exit, right? You know, there are really only two ways out the door, which is what we're fundamentally looking for. We, you know, we don't win unless there's an exit. So, you know, predominantly in ag and food, it's 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 M&A, which is being acquired by someone, right, or merging with someone. The other and rare opportunity is in, in the go public space. And I think, you know, one also has to step back from that scenario and say, well, how big does your company have to get in order to go public? You know, how much does it have to fit into, you know, another company's product line or strategy in order to be successful and to be acquired? And, you know, very much so we tend to assess, you know, many of those outcomes, you know, before we write the first check. I mean, if we don't see a clear path to exit, we're not going to write the first check. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, I think you really have to have an understanding of, 
you know, where does this go in the long run, right? You don't have to be correct. You don't have to necessarily believe it's going to happen soon, but you have to have, you know, it can't just be a boil the ocean scenario. You have to have a small, you know, it's not the universe, it's the solar system. There has to be not a million planets, but five or 10 or 15 or 20 opportunities for a larger entity to either acquire you or the ability for you to scale this business to get to a public exit within the confines of our investment. And, you know, to, to my colleague's point earlier, you know, at, you know, taking VC, uh, you know, capital is not for everyone. It is a treadmill that you're getting on. The intensity is high. And, you know, a lot of people can great build great businesses and reach great exits and create tremendous wealth without having to come and work with us. So, you know, I, I, I always encourage entrepreneurs to step back and say, what is the best option? You know, there's, you know, especially in the ag space today, there, there's a lot of public funding available. There's a lot of incubator dollars out there. And, and let you really build your business before you come to us and, and have a conversation around it. Because, you know, we're going to force you to think through, we're going to force you to make decisions that, you know, may not be what you're interested in doing. Thank you. Uh, that, that's very helpful. Um, and I think it's probably good background information, given the percentage of first time founders that are in the audience. Um, sort of similarly on a, on a nuts and bolts level, you know, for those ag tech companies that are in your portfolio or you're 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 looking at who you think might be investable, like what what are some concrete ad, advice that you're giving to those companies in terms of weathering this down market or this period of time that we're in right now? I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, a great one is our molecular diagnostic company, a company called Pathogen DX. They do high speed food testing. You know, they're working with the likes of Tyson, et cetera. You know, they made a call, you know, with our support to move into the broader ag space about five years ago. Uh, you know, we looked at the space, we looked at the adoption cycles, et cetera, you know, and, and they took some time and went off into the cannabis space where the price sensitivity wasn't there, where, you know, uh, contamination was a much more costly problem at $2,000 a pound versus, you know, $1.50 a pound. And they've been able to bring that price per test down from, you know, hundreds of dollars to, you know, double digit dollars to three dollars. Right. Now they're able to go into an ag space with the same cost as a Petri dish. Right. We like to look at stuff like that. You know, they've got, you know, 20 percent quarter over quarter growth. They're building a fundamentally strong business. You know, so they've been able to, you know, and it's a great case study here because you can look at it and you say, OK. They built a great foundation. You know, they're going to be a mid eight figure business, you know, growing 20 percent, 20 percent for the indefinite future. That's where, you know, the injection from venture, the up round from venture is able to then propel that company. It allows them to spend more, deploy more, capture more market share. But without fundamental foundations like that, you know, these are Hail Mary type runs. Right. And I and I especially want to try and, you know, push this advice to software entrepreneurs trying to break into, you know, broadly the, the ag space. I mean, it's very, very challenging. What makes sense as a software person, you know, unless, you know, you live on a farm and have found a problem that, that none of your neighbors can get through without your software, you probably need to rethink your market. Okay. You know, you need to solve real problems. I mean, you know, I would more likely invest in a agriculture tiny house builder to be able to provide shelter for farm workers than I would a piece of distributed ledger software for the ag industry. <laughs> were you were you saying that because there was a blockchain question that was floating? Yeah, yeah. I I, I wanted to, to find, I wanted to find a really really good you know visual example of a choice, right? Yeah. Tiny house for farm workers, blockchain. You know, and then everybody in agriculture buys tiny houses. Okay. And that's that's how it works. I'm not saying farmers don't trade crypto, but you know, I mean they've all got plaid already and they've all got wallets already. And you know, they're really smart folk. Uh got it. Okay. So so continuing to to look at and reassess the market and figure out if there's a pivot is, is sort of one, one piece of concrete advice or one example. Um it, what about sometimes we hear about uh either raising additional capital. I think, Claire, maybe we were talking about this uh, ahead of the panel in terms of, you know, companies, some founders are considering, you know, raising a larger round than they otherwise would have 
uh, does that make sense or what, what you know what is the panel's impression on that strategy to try and get some extra gas in the tank if you will and extend the runway yeah i think it's like uh, i think anna or if i don't remember who said it that that you know adding to the the seed round and extending it through you know bridge or through safe um has been what we've been seeing is to get more more capital teed up so that they can get more commercial growth for that next round or to to advance their um testing like peptobiotics which is um, fermentated peptides, a microbial approach to to eliminating the need for antibiotics, and and that's what they've been doing, and it's working really well to get the momentum going, get the test results done, and then they'll have a much bigger bash when it comes to the to the to the um, to the, the the price round, and so we're seeing that we're seeing rounds that like with Thai Aqua, they started off at one number and in the middle decided to increase it. Um, so that they would, to be honest, they're growing so fast from a revenue perspective. They, they, um, it's all word of mouth. They don't even have a sales team. So what they've been doing with without a, a proper sales team is pretty phenomenal. And so now with this funding, they're going to be able to get that that hockey stick growth that that Anna mentioned. So yeah, I think everybody with to be cautious. They've been they've been you know um opening themselves up for a bit more capital willing to give give up even a little bit more of their equity just to make sure that there's you know the the skittishness that exists in the market um doesn't turn into anything else i don't think it will i mean in, at least in asia pacific it's you know there's a lot of capital here that's uh floating around and trying to find the right deals to land on. I think where we always still have the challenge, and I'm like a clanging bell on this because this is what I think about day in, day out, is early stage investment. I mean, it's so, if you don't do this bit, if you don't work with these companies and help them get through their, their you know, fragile state, and, 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 and as much as, you know, it's a market where, you know, you might think that founders shouldn't be picky, they can be a bit, you know, look for those kind of funds that are going to help you, um, not just it, it provide you with capital, but also the smart kind of, you know, subject matter expertise that you need to either finish your science or, or get access to those strategics and, 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 and venture capital is going to work with you. And that's what we do. We pride ourselves on it. And I think that that's, it's a necessary thing that, um, you, you know, as much as that it's about um, us serving our LPs 100% um, in their investment, we serve them best by making sure that these companies, you know, proceed ahead and advance. And, you know, so I, I do think that you, you can be smart about the kind of venture capital that you work with. I also think that LPs need to, to think about where they put their money in investing in funds. There's still a big gap between uh, early stage fund investing, and then those that are coming in at the B and C level for being an LP in a fund. There needs to be more LPs investing in early stage capital, venture capital. My soapbox. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I come from the world, you know, I'm a former entrepreneur that exited myself. So, you know, I come from the world, if you're not profitable company, that you should try and take capital whenever you can take it, right? That is the underlying rule, especially in this market. Um, you know, you, you really need to, to, to take it when you can get it, you know, it's, it, you know, not really thinking too much about valuations right now, because, you know, if you're not around at the end of the cycle, your valuation really doesn't matter, right? So, so in a large degree, you know, one of the things that tends to happen during this cycle, you know, those of us in the venture space tend to do a lot of soul, soul searching, a lot of portfolio evaluation, this is never a good thing for entrepreneurs and portfolios because you know you, you're going to get snapshotted now by us taking a look and saying geez you know fish or cut bait is this company really going to deliver is it going to deliver in the timeline and as an entrepreneur you might have had your next big inflection point right around the corner but when we're looking at it you know we're going to make decisions on where you're at today and, and you know and you're going to have to go in and have deep conversations with us about where you can get it and and how hard it is for you to to turn the corner but you know uh, there will be and we're already seeing a lot of portfolio resets now a lot of decisions being made inside of the venture fund saying look we're not going to continue to fund these companies because we just don't see 
the exit trajectory out there. So, you know, when, when you've got an early stage entrepreneur, you know, the piece that I think is always missing when, when they come in to see us is what is your exit strategy, right? You know, you know, who's going to buy you? Why are they going to buy you? You know, give me, you know, your pyramid of acquirers, you know, based on the correlation and, and talk to me about that because that's what I want to know, because as a venture investor, as, as a participant in this category, I probably sit on a board with everybody on your pyramid, whether it's Kellogg's or whether it's VCs or whether it's Walmart or Tyson. And if I'm on the board with them and you tell me, oh, yeah, Tyson's going to buy me tomorrow, I can make a single phone call and find out, is that a realistic thing? So, you know, you need to have it together. You need to have a great assessment, because if you can show me your path to exit, you're going to get my attention. And if I can validate it and you've been honest and truthful, then I think, you know, you're in a great position to work with us on the venture side. Yeah, I'll maybe add a couple of things in terms of a concrete advice um, in, in this environment. I think focus is very important for you as a founder. Um, sometimes we invest in companies and they have all these ideas and we're going to do this and our technology can be applied here and here and outside of agriculture. And on the one hand, it's good because it increases your potential market, but uh, on the other hand, it may derail you from achieving real results. And in markets like this, especially, it's very important to be on top of we can deliver, set up goals and deliver them. And so we've been advising a lot of companies just, you know, put all your other programs on the side for now. Uh, pick the one that you really think is the winner and double down. Right. So that's one. Uh, clear milestones, uh, as I mentioned, to have, especially between the fundraising, uh, keep it lean, don't overhire. And I mean, you know, a lot of the companies uh, have been laying off a lot of people and you've seen that as well in, in venture capital among startups. Uh, maybe it's not as public because these are not public companies, uh, but it, it's been happening. So when you're building out a team, make sure uh, you have the right people for the right roles and they really bring the value to you. Um, and for you as a CEO, we always say you have to be really good at two things in early stage. It's hiring and fundraising. If you really don't feel comfortable about fundraising, you have to figure out how to do it. You have to learn, take classes, attend, I don't know, something, public speaking courses, something that's going to make you feel comfortable uh, about the process because it, it's very crucial if you want to fundraise uh, from venture capital um, investors. Fantastic. And that, that actually brings us to about the hour mark. Um, so before we transition and pivot into the Q&A, you know, to the extent, um, Claire, Anna, or, or F, if you want to be contacted, can you provide your contact information or the best way to do that? Maybe I'll start with you, Claire. Uh, sure. Um, my email, should I type it in the chat? It's totally up to you. Or, or verbal is just fine. That's right. Claire at the yieldlab.com. Great. Happy, happy to to speak with and connect with any of you. I can drop it off as well. It's okay. a fakina dcdc.com. Yeah, and and I recommend LinkedIn. I mean, you know, the the noise in our in in my inbox is too high for our external. I recommend going to LinkedIn. Apologies in advance if I'm a slow response. Just you know, bear in mind, you know, especially in this market, you know, we're responding to our portfolio companies and their needs sort of first and foremost. And if you want, you know, for those of you out there interested in connecting with me, you know, just generally connect on LinkedIn is great. And if you've got a specific conversation you want to set up, send me an email, but don't send me any confidential information. Uh, you know, <laughs> unless and until we've run a complex check and got an engagement agreement in place. And so that's getting ahead of ourselves. All right, let's pivot into the Q&A session. Uh, session. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take questions of general applicability. Uh, hopefully, you know, you've gotten inspired by today's conversation to, to ask a few, and I'm going to take a look here. Um, I guess one, one thing we haven't really talked about uh, is, is policy. Um, and, and I would like to, you know, is there, I'd like to know to the panelists, 
you know, which policies in the U.S. and and abroad, Claire, because you're in Asia, are, are you following that are impacting the the ag tech space? Is there anything that's particularly exciting or that you see that uh, startups might be able to take advantage of, whether it's the Farm Bill or um, the Inflation Reduction Act? We were talking a little bit earlier about um, ESG and climate. I mean, Asia Pacific is so fragmented with com- countries, right? We're just so many different countries. Right. So there's no, uh, you know, each each country has kind of its own um, initiatives and things that, that can help drive up. I mean, Singapore is really good at, you know, they've got the 30 by 30 initiative and, and everything pretty much aligns around that. It's run, Singapore's run like a well-oiled company. So there's all kinds of, uh, you know, initiatives that are happening. I mean, you see that alternative proteins are getting approved really quickly by the Singapore Food Agency here, you know, to sell um, cell-based chicken and things faster than other countries are. So there's kind of a race to that. There's three areas of, of focus for Singapore, which is in this initiative, which is aquaculture, controlled environment, egg, and um, uh a plant-based or cell-based protein. So if you're, you know, if that's an area of your interest, I, I can't say, I, I can tell you Singapore's your place, um, really great uh, IP protection laws here and um, strong venture capital and family funds that are based out of here. So, and then plus all the government initiatives and grants that they have in place. Uh, um, it's a good place for innovators, especially if you align around those three areas. Yeah, I mean, you know, U.S. farmers, you know, on, on all levels are very policy oriented. Many of them have law firms like like Jason. I know uh, you recommended, you know, various, uh, you know, uh, consultants to us and, and political action folks for some of our portfolio companies over the years. I encourage all of the entrepreneurs to stay in touch with their law firms. They tend to, you know, monitor that stuff very closely. There's you know, a, a, a massive amount of that, and that is the framework of U.S. agriculture to a large degree. I mean, I think the issues that we're seeing, uh, you know, which are a little more, you know, painful and in, in, in informing some of our investment decisions is, for example, in the in the state of California, you know, generators, uh, you know, are on on a on a on a straight outlawed path, right? So, the ability to utilize gasoline power, diesel power generators. Uh, you know, will become limited. There is a lot of downward pressure in the ag space to uh, limit emissions. And, you know, when you think about that, you know, geez, you know, how much emissions are, are is agriculture putting out? You know, big ag, for example, in the Midwest, you know, they're talking about, you know, 10 pieces of machinery per thousand acres. That's not a lot. But you get out into the more densely populated, both here, Europe, Asia, uh, you know, California, I think, is really the bellwether there, you know, you know, since we have the particular geography in the Central Valley here. But emissions is a huge issue and farmers are going to have to make a decision whether they are going to utilize machinery versus sprayed inputs and other things like that. You know, mostly because, you know, their families, their farm workers are 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 really being negatively impacted, let alone the planet. Right. So, you know, I think that drives us to look at it and, you know, look downstream and say, OK, you know, we're, we're encouraging high tech robotics, drones, uh, all kinds of new tech that that farmers can utilize out in the field. They don't really have any way to power that. Right. I mean, they've got old deal suit generators, which are now being outlawed. So what do farmers do? How do they manage that? So, you know, that that informed our decision around investing in a in a portable power company that, that, that is battery technology. You know, farmers have plenty of opportunity to do solar, but, you know, you know, solar needs to be captured in some way and it needs to power things and it needs to power it in a, in a mobile capacity. Right. So so that gets really interesting. You know, we've seen, you know, large ag companies like Driscoll move refrigeration into the field because that extends the shelf life of, you know, high end berries, for example. Right. Well, you know, that's a situation where you've got generators running all day long and, you know, you could extend that all the way into food carts. You know, sadly, the average food cart 
you know, operator standing next to a three kilowatt generator. That's basically like sucking off the end of a car tailpipe for eight hours a day. So there is a huge problem in this category. And, you know, it, it, at some point, health and safety actually moves the needle when, when, you know, when your kid is having to have nebulizer treatments every day because they can't breathe. I, I mean, I, for, I mean, that's, that's a powerful analogy. Uh, F and, and visual picture, but I mean, in one sense, it's even potentially worse than that. I mean, I remember reading about just how much emissions the generators put, and it's like something like 400 cars or something because they don't have catalytic converters. Like, it, it depends on the generator and everything, right? But right. some of them no, no. Be, I mean, you're spot be, on. Yeah, spot on. I mean, and you look at a company like United Rentals, which is one of the largest generator providers on a rental basis. You know, and that's both short and long term in the U.S. You know, that's a, you know, a three to five billion dollar piece of business in just one rental company. And they represent less than 20 percent of the rental leasing market for the generator space. Right. So that's a really big one. And so, you know, I think we view that as you can't get the rest of the farm rolling until you solve these big problems. And, you know, that wasn't as interesting. And it was a harder sell when you were talking about 80 cent pink diesel. I don't know if everybody's familiar, but in the in the ag space, they call it pink diesel. They actually put a dye into the into the the fuel source and allow it to go without the additives that the consumers mm -hmm. have. So it's a much lower cost solution, uh, you know, for farmers. But even that now is into the dollar two dollar plus plus range, right? So now you're into a situation where the farmers are, you know, being able to say, okay, I can use wind, I can charge a battery. Now I need to make that battery move. Now all of a sudden, you know, a farmer looks at it and said, ooh. Less about emissions, a lot more about free power, free power plus emission, you know. So it's solutions like that that, you know, and just to give you an idea, you know, when you talk about fundraising, you know, that company's only raised four or five million dollars. That company is already generating millions of dollars in revenue. That is a company that when you look at venture and you say, okay, what does it, you know, what does it need to look like? That's what it needs to look like. Less in more out and a whole bunch of people that are going to buy them one day. Uh, I'll just uh, add maybe or say about two areas where we've seen a uh, potential opportunity within the shift of uh, policy. One is the sustainability um, ESG and uh, green tech, right? So uh, you can divide it in two, you can bucket in one, uh, but when you look, I think it's especially happening outside of the U.S. U.S. is a little slow in sustainability and uh, climate overall. Um, but one of the investments we did, for example, was into an insecticide company that used uh, microbial fermentation uh, to make pheromones. And that was a huge theme in Europe. They had a law that um, enforced all ag to move into sustainable um, agriculture and pesticides. And so a lot of the big companies, of course, got into um, uh, a panic mode of, you know, we have a lot of, of our products uh, that are chemical based and we really need to find something that's more sustainable. And so when we invested in this company, it was very clear that there is going to be um, a huge interest from the industry. And um, the company was bought in a year and a half from our investment. Um, so that sort of shows you, you know, if you figure out the right positioning and the right uh, sort of pool from the market, um, that's probably the best place to go uh, in the ag space. And then the whole climate sustainability theme is also rapidly developing and you see a lot of climate funds uh, that are being uh, formed these days. Um, and uh, that, that's also, we're not purely focused on that, but if we see the right opportunity, we're going to invest. We invested in a company called Stage 4 Global that uses a sprig offset seaweed um, uh, that you formulate as a heat additive for cows. And that reduces methane by 90%, up to 90%, which is quite a lot. And there are a lot of areas within uh, the, the ad where you can focus on that. And uh, the challenge is in the U.S. with obviously the carbon credits, and it, it's not enforced. It's really done by on a voluntary basis. But you know that's probably one area you can uh, focus and monitor if uh, there are rising opportunities. Uh, but generally, investors are quite 
um, excited or at least interested in that space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so shifting just a little bit, you know, <laughs> here we are in 2023, and I don't think we could have a panel if the topic of artificial intelligence and generative AI did not come up. Uh, and so I was, you know, uh, curious to get your thoughts as to how, I mean, maybe specifically generative AI is or is not trying to be integrated into ag tech and if it's not sort of whether or not it's the interest in AI in general has sort of picked back up. I feel like, I don't know, 2016, 2017, 2018 was very hot with respect to AI and ML machine learning. And then it sort of was still around, but it is back uh, with a vengeance now with generative AI. So what, what are you seeing? I mean, you know, you know, AI on a farm has a, you know, a number of different areas that are that are interesting. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, farmers are still and the, and the entire supply chain, you know, as a whole, you know, is still subject to so many different variables, right? Um, that, you know, I, I'm not sure it makes a, a big difference. You know, software in this, you know, AI in the supply chain may move the needle a little bit. I'm, I'm just not sure you know, it's something that that is applicable here, right? Uh, you know, all farmers have cell phones, all farmers have tablets, they're, you know, equally high tech, you know, combines have, you know, huge, you know, 13 inch touch screens in there. So I'm sure there's lots of ways that they could, you know, use that tech in optimizing. But, you know, the, the question I drive back, draw back to, and this is, you know, as a whole in, in the broader investment space, you know, is this an, is this a company or is this a product, right? And I think you know, I think this is you know really being realized today back into the traditional tech space, but in agriculture as a whole, I think that's a really big subject matter. And when you get into these really, you know, sort of thin slice models, you've got to make sure that you know, to Anna's point earlier, that the market opportunity is really there to be a company, let alone a big company, let alone a big exit. You know. Yeah. And he, yeah, and oh, 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 go go for it. Sir. No, no, please, Anna, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I, I'll just highlight, I mean, as a fund, we do look into uh, deep tech and uh, we do invest on intersection of AI and uh, biotech, for example. And some of these companies can apply uh, AI engines for um crop engineering as well, right? So you can use that and uh, there are companies that apply that. So that's one way of application. Um, I, I think AI broadly is more applicable within agriculture. Generative AI, I think is a little bit, maybe um, you'll find fewer examples of that, uh, but within AI, you'll see computer vision used a lot, you know, uh, companies like Blue River that was bought some time ago. We have a couple of companies, Burden Robotics, um, that uses computer vision and high precision spraying and uh, fields and orchards. And, um, you know, that's definitely being used. Um, and um, I, I think you'll see more and more applications uh, of generative um, AI specifically in ACTAC as you see more and more data being compiled together. And I think a lot of the companies today are sort of on the path to get there, a lot of them are in the field to working with their maybe first machines or maybe 10, 20 machines. So there's still not that much data. Uh, but if you ask any uh, company that compiles data, I think that's something that they want to use in the long term. They want to analyze the data, make predictions, uh, make it more useful for the farmer. And that's you know part of the business model in the long term. Whether we as VCs will see that or not uh, before they exit, that's a question, but that's definitely a topic of um, communication and you know potential application uh, in the active space. Yeah, and, and Asia is pretty basic. I mean, you know, we're we're yeah, the land of smallholders. I saw a question in the chat about, you know, what about the small farmers? Uh, it's exactly eighty percent of our pro everything's coming from the smallholders here and. 
you know, like Anna's saying, if you don't get everybody on on the platform or get access to the data, what's the point of having, you know, sophisticated AI? It's about making decisions and being able to, to capture data so that you can get those insights and then extract, you know, a predictive or prescriptive action. Um, so got to do that first um, and get as many of the get get a value proposition that will suffice for farmers who can't afford to pay to monetize. So the value proposition for a, a company in a region that's filled with smallholders is not selling to the smallholders. It's selling to somebody else who's going to then pay for the value that's going to come from the smallholders. It's a different, a completely different way of monetization. Yeah, and I, I just want to clarify. I mean, I think what we're, you know, I just want to be clear that utilizing AML, ML, AI within the confines, within the core operations of your software analytics, et cetera, that, I mean, that's not even a thing. It's expected. If you're not doing it, you shouldn't be writing software. What I'm talking about is leading a conversation with I am AI, therefore you should listen to me versus, right. I, you know, and that's what Claire just said, which is, I am a great product that solves great things. Oh, and by the way, I'm using the best possible AI I can get my hands on to even make that product better is the way the conversation starts. I mean, just FYI, we had an exit in AI in 2004. Okay, so like this is like the fifth coming of AI. So, you know, anybody, you know, just like if you lead the conversation by saying blockchain or AI or, you know, pick your flavor. I remember when they would come and say Java, okay? Does anybody even on this thing remember when they said Java, not to date myself too much here? It doesn't matter. It's all about what's functional and are, you know, is the best engine under the hood. I would expect that if your software is your tech. People will probably bring up Python a lot more than Java these days. There you go. That's my point. That's my point. And, and Python will become the next thing and become the next thing and become the next thing. So at the end of the day, the, the end user that isn't viewing code, just, you know, like Claire's point, the thing's got to work. If you can make it work better, faster, that's great. We expect that of you. So we touched a little bit earlier, shifting again, thank you. Um, so shifting again, we touched a little bit earlier about ESG, um, and I think we've sort of focused a bit more on climate, which would be the E in there, but there have been a number of questions sort of about, you know, progress of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think, you know, I think both with respect to companies in ag tech, and then also probably within agriculture a little bit more broadly, and would love to get the panels sort of, um, temperature on or insight into how you know DEI continues to evolve and be measured and be sort of taken into account uh in 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 ag tech and venture more generally. Yeah, well I mean, you know, here here in the United States, you know, ag tech has sort of two flavors, right? You've got big farming and industrial farming, you've got family farming, right? These are these are two, you know, elements. I will say you know, on the West Coast and the Southeast, you know, as a whole, you know, it, it's pretty diverse um, in some degrees. But, you know, a, a farming, as always, was based on land ownership, right? So, you know, there are bigger issues than those of us, at least in my opinion, in the venture space to tackle. I think we view it through the lens of we are gender and colorblind when it comes to entrepreneurs of any type. We invest in the best of the best. We don't care, you know, what you are. If your dog has the best piece of software, we will invest in your dog, okay? That is it. Our job is to deploy capital and return 10X on capital. I don't care. If your lizard can do it, we will fund your lizard. So that, you know, we have absolutely no dog in any fight. And, you know, just as, as a whole, as an industry, I'd like to pull us back from the edge on this conversation. If you look at the panel today, we're a fairly diverse group of folks. We do our best. And, uh, you know, you know, like we said, we're too busy looking for great deals, great entrepreneurs and putting money to work to really, you know, worry about or, you know, not, you know, make sure that, that, that we're doing our best. Yeah, I can echo that. I, I think, um, you know, the, the most important is really find the right company to invest in. Uh, we have companies where we have 
um, you know, diversity. And I, I think it also brings, uh, comes to the point where uh, companies also need to install that in their culture. We have some companies that are really focused on that, some maybe less so, but it's definitely great to see when people think about it. Um, I, I do think that this is a very competitive environment and you definitely need to be uh, able to meet the criteria to, to compete uh, regardless of where you're coming from. So, you know, um, but, but I don't really feel that there's um, a big separation that because you might be of different um, color and background, you're not being evaluated properly. Um, what I would say is that sometimes when people have different cultural backgrounds, it's it just harder to click. Um, but I think it's anywhere. And um, I, I think in that case, I just recommend people to really um, communicate with uh, the companies that were successful in fundraising, learning from them, how, like, what are the tools and skills you use? How can I improve my way of communication? Is it something that I learn uh, or, you know, imply or don't? So there's a lot of EQ, right? You need to bring the, um, uh, the communication skills up and, uh, and work on that. But um, that's probably like one of the uh, advice that, that I can give to pretty much anybody. You'd be surprised that um, people of all kinds of backgrounds struggle with communication skills. Um, and that's something that um, I think everybody can benefit from improving. Yeah, I mean, you know, sorry, go on, Claire. No, no it's okay, please. Yeah, I, I was just going to, you know, following on Anna's point, you know, great, you know, good leaders of businesses take into consideration, you know, the best practices. Best practice means you should be including all of those aspects, uh, you know, as you've talked about diversity, inclusion, et cetera, within the fabric of your business, you know, and, you know, the next important milestone that happens in that category, you should incorporate in your business. And as an executive, if you're not well-informed and well-educated regarding those pieces, then it then it's a, it's a core deficiency. And, you know, to Anna's point, hiring well requires understanding, having a good EQ when it comes to the space. It's super important. So, you know, if, if you're not paying attention, you know, to these broader, you know, issues regarding, you know, employee management, and and the world at large, then then you're not doing your job as an executive. Where I thought clear. you were kind of, where I thought you were kind of going with the the climate and uh, it was maybe towards like uh, you know the impact measurements and and you know um, effects to you know improving quality of life and things like this from the startup perspective. You know this is something that. <laughs> All of our companies are having to, to capture and measure, and 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 uh, we as a fund rolling it up um, because we're at the ground level at early stage. So, seeing what what um, you know uh, how credit AI is is providing uh, small accredited loans as opposed to uh, going through loan sharks through um, banks and scaling with this getting into this one banks want to get into the one point six billion dollar market. Um, and it's good for the smallholders who own less than a hectare or two of land to be able to um, have a bit more time for this loan, use it only for through a smart card to deploy it. And there's five members in their family. And they're always one crop away from losing their farm. Um, and these things are just highly measurable and, and really transformative. Um, when that goes pear shape, um, it's a bad, bad story. So um, you know, the family goes into the children of soul prostitution. There's a high suicide rate in India. It's a real, real problem in agriculture in India. So, so these sorts of things are really very basic, um, but being able, they're so important um, to the survivability of these smallholders and rolling up these, these, these ESG goals. I mean, it's very simple um, because they're right in your face. Um, same thing with with everything we do around agriculture is that we make sure that, there's, that these are captured as far as what their effect will be long-term, whether it be saving water, um, whether it be reducing the amount of fertigation going into the soil and heavy metals. So these, um, I think it's an important aspect of what we do and talk about, and we tend to talk about it a little bit more these days as funds. 
Well, well, thank you, Claire. Thank you, panel. Uh, I think we're about to wrap up, but I want to give each of you maybe 30 seconds. And if there's any advice or guidance you want to share with the audience in terms of, you know, steps to take if you're an initial entrepreneur or, you know, where you think there's a hot opportunity, uh, I'll let you go for it. Maybe we'll start with you, F. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, as I said earlier, and, and echoing with my colleagues, now is a great time to start businesses. You know, in in a down market like this, it exposes, you know, weaknesses across an entire industries. Uh, you know, finding those weaknesses, finding those you know problem spots, creating great solves for that, is what entrepreneurs are all about, right? You know, our job here is, you know to fund great companies, help help entrepreneurs build them and help them achieve meaningful exits. I mean, that that's our job here. So, you know, come up with great, great problem solves and bring them to us. Claire? Yeah, uh, 100% Ephraim. It's, it's uh, you know, we see no end of deal flow. So lots of, lots of cool innovation out there. Um, the ones I, I love are the ones that chase me down, you know, so, um, I, I, you know, they're, 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 I, I know they're fantastic and I know, you know, meet them once, but when they keep coming back after me, it does require me to take another look. And, um, so be persistent. Don't be annoying, but be, you know, be, be persistent. Um, if you're sure you're, you've got an innovation, we don't invest in ideas, uh, it has to be innovation that's proven. Um, uh, so you have to do your hard work um, and make sure that you've been able to prove your innovation um, and 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 the value proposition more than just a concept because we're not, at least our fund is not doing venture building. So, you know, please, uh, we're excited about the, 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 what we're seeing in regards to the comprehensiveness in our region of innovation, it's not just all the needle stuff. For a while, there we were wondering around alter, uh, alternate proteins. So in our in our region, but it's uh, really very much expanded. Um, so that's great. Uh, so thank you for the the time on the panel, uh, Jason. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. So there, there you have it, audience. I, and we'll uh, make sure you run a drip campaign on Claire if you want uh, if you want to uh, get investment and make sure you don't talk to F unless you know how to exit. Uh, Anna, <laughs> any closing words? <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, I'd say, you know, follow the passion you have um, and curiosity. But um, as I think we highlighted a number of times, um, uh, make sure it's uh, solid and you have, uh, you, you've put a lot of work into that. Uh, know the blind spots you have and hire well to fill in those blind spots. Uh, that will allow you to build a stronger, better company um, and persevere. Um, you know, uh, I believe there's no failure until you stop trying. So whatever it is, like if you're really passionate about something, you just continue working on it and uh, the opportunities will come your way. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Anna Fokina. Ephraim Lindenbaum and Claire Pribula. I want to thank the audience for attending live and those who are watching on a time-shifted basis. Thank you for watching the recording. Thank you, Idea to IPO, for organizing today's event. And thank you, KNL Gates, for uh, sponsoring and supporting it. With that in mind, I'll let you get back to building your great companies. Have a great day. Take care. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.